Hi, and welcome back to the second part of my talk. In this part of the talk, I'm going to explore some of the more recent unpublished work that I have. Um, and we're going to be dealing with the uh, behavioural aspects that are superior in elite retrieving dogs versus other dogs. And the breed we're going to be concentrating on is Labrador. And in the second part, we'll be talking about evolution of reproductive biology in the dog, which I think is really, really fascinating uh, and exciting area of new research for me. So we're going to start with uh, mapping traits that are associated with retrieving. And uh, some background is that uh, in my other life, when I'm not being a university professor or doing canine research, I have a home life where I have uh, Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers and I very much enjoy um, practicing retrieving trial, not practicing, undertaking retrieving trials with my dogs. Um, and I'll explain a little bit uh, how the process of a retrieving trial occurs in a moment. But it fascinated me that, um, that I could see, just as we w in the first part of my talk, uh, we were talking about a breed split in the Kelpie. I, I really like this idea of exploring the, the diversity within a breed to learn more about behavioural characteristics of that breed. And so while other research groups compare different breeds to one another to find answers about behaviours that are intrinsic in those breeds, the, the approach in my lab is that we don't expect all retrievers to retrieve, and in fact I, I know they don't because I have a Labrador at home, Theo, who doesn't retrieve at all. Um, but, but we do, so we can't expect that all retrievers retrieve, and so it's not always a perfect assessment to um, expect to find traits associated with retrieving by re comparing retrievers with other breeds and just presuming they're going to retrieve because they have retriever in their name. And so the approach that we take is to look within a breed and to look for the diversity of experience of the dogs and behaviours of the dogs within that breed to try and tease out a little bit more about what makes those dogs exceptional. So um, in my uh, role uh, in my retrieving trial competitions, um, I'm also actually a novice retrieving trial judge. So I, actually last weekend I was, I was judging at a retrieving trial. Um, I noticed that the behaviours and uh, characteristics of the dogs that were achieving the very highest levels of award in those competitions were phenotypically and behaviourally different than the average Labradors, for example, that even though there are other breeds besides Labradors, the Labradors are the ones that I'm concentrating on in this project. And so um, can we use this, this uh, diversity between the average Labrador that you might see as a pet or as a service dog um, compared with these elite retrieving dogs, can we use that difference to better understand what is the genetic, what goes behind the genetics of the behaviours that we see in these dogs? So first of all, just let me uh, explain to you the process of undertaking, what, what sort of skills are required to undertake a retrieving trial in Australia, because it's likely very different than the country where you live if you're not Australian. Um, so typically, a, a retrieving dog in Australia, retrieving trials are undertaken usually in farmland, similar to the beautiful farmland that we're in at the moment. And typically what is required is we'll have a... Uh, a catapult that's set up some way distant in the field. Um, the retrieving competitions in Australia, uh, the dogs might have to uh, retrieve game from distances between one uh, of up to 150 metres, which is about 180 yards or so. Um, and uh, over that, but that's the distance as the crow flies. So line of sight with a, a distance measuring device. Actually, as the dog runs, it might be considerably more because they might put hills and gullies and rivers and rocks and bushes and everything in between. And so, um, these, so the very first thing that happens is that in Australia, we, I, I just want to say for a start that you see that this dog here is carrying a bird. The bird that this dog is carrying is a pigeon. This pigeon is not, we don't use live game in any way, shape or form in retrieving trials in Australia. That's not legal. So all of these animals are sourced through feral pest control pro programs and we use, they're, they're, not, they're not killed for the purposes of the trial. They're already um, being disposed of for other reasons. And so these animals are brought frozen to site. Um, the catapult is used to cast the item of game uh, for, the for the dog to retrieve. 
So the order of progress of the trial is that the owner and the handler and the dog um, come up to this, what we call the control point for the trial, at which point the owner um, hands over the collar and the leash from the dog, so the dog runs completely naked, there's nothing on the dog at all. Um, and the uh, uh, control point uh, steward hands the owner a, gu a gun that contains two blank cartridges. They make a noise, they don't actually fire anything. And so then uh, with the broken gun, the owner and the dog proceed with the dog off lead to what's called the firing point. At the firing point, um, the owner takes up position, asks their dog to watch. Um, you can imagine that this is a quite exciting moment for the dog because the dog knows what's coming. At that point, uh, the judge will signal to the steward on the thrower and they will cast the item of game. As the item of game reaches the zenith of its arc, the owner will shoot that item of game, at which point the dog has to remain steady. And then when the item of game is on the ground for some small period of time, the owner then sends the dog to retrieve that item of game. And this is a, called a single marked retrieve. The desirable aspect is that the dog uh, progresses in a direct line to that item of game, identifies the area of the fall, and when it's in the area of the fall, it, it should actually have seen the area of, of the fall, so it needs good vision. But when it gets there, that bird may have fallen into dense undergrowth, or it may have fallen, rolled down a bank, it may have floated down a river, or there may be any number of obstacles in, in between that require the dog then to use its olfactory uh, senses to identify where that item of game is. So it needs to know the scent that it's looking for, and then it needs to detect that within the area of the fall, and then it needs to pick that bird up, bring it back to the handler, and then present it. In Australia, we present at the front, so the dog will come to the front of the handler, sit down and say, look, here's the bird, at which point the handler takes the bird gently from the dog, and then they heel back to the um, control point where they surrender the bird, where it's checked to make sure there's no marks on it, the gun, and then the lead and collar are returned to the person. That's the lowest level of the trial. That can be done on land or in water. At higher levels of the trial, there are more intricate manoeuvres required of the dog. So, for example, there might be two birds thrown and you have to send the dog in a sequence to capture each, to get each one. So the dog has to remember where the first one was. After it's come back from the first one, it needs to go and get the other one. Or the dog might be asked to, um, they might send up another bird while the dog's running out to get the first one. So the dog has to ignore that one for now go and get the one it was sent for, bring that back, and then go and get the second one. Or they may hide a bird, so the dog never even sees the cast, at which point the handler has to send the dog and direct the dog with hand signals out to the area of the fall, at which point the dog is expected to identify where that uh, item of game is and return it. So those are the kind of skills. That's how a retrieving trial is undertaken in Australia. It's lots of fun. If you have a retriever, I encourage people to get out and do it because the dogs absolutely adore it, um, even those that are not quite so high-skilled as this um, dog here, which is an Australian champion uh, retriever. So all the photographs here are taken by Al Dodge, who's my partner, and they were taken at the National Retrieving Trial um, two years ago. So... Um, one of the interesting things in the, um, in the Australian retrieving scene lately is that the very vast majority of the dogs that are at the elite level are admixed, which means that we have, by admixed we mean we've blended in a different population of dogs to produce the genetics of those dogs. And um, you can't deny in this sport that genetics, if you ask any retrieving person if genetics are important in retrieving, they will say yes, absolutely, most definitely. And they are real believers in, in uh, the genetic differences that these dogs exhibit in terms of this sport. They also look quite different. Um, most of them are you that have, what's happened is that a couple of breeders in Australia have... Um, connected with elite field trial champion retrieving bloodlines in America and have imported elite retrieving um, sires to Australia and then have bred those with their Australian bitches. 
um, to produce the retrieving dogs that we're seeing out in the field at the moment. And we do also have some pure American imports as well. But the big difference is compared with your average Australian Labrador, which is of the, in America you would call it an English lab type, so they tend to be smaller, shorter legs, a bit, sorry, need I say dumpier. Um, there are, we, the, the kind of pet name is the Flabrador. Um, <laughs> so that's the common pet lab in Australia, is that kind of Labrador. These guys, as you can see in this picture, uh, are very different. This dog's name's Archie. Um, they have very high drive, very high energy, they're very lean, they're very muscular, they're skeletally different, they're a little finer in bone, they have longer legs, longer body, taller dog. Um, and yeah, they're quite different to look at than the Australian Labradors. So the way we did this study is uh, similar to the way we did the Kelpie selective sweep study. What we did was we uh, took DNA from uh, a number of these dogs that were from these uh, elite retrieving dogs and we uh, sent them away for genotyping at uh, Neogen Laboratories, which is in Nebraska. And we, retrie we retrieved 170,000 markets for each dog from that process. We already had in hand a large number of Labradors from other projects that we work on. So we have a large number of guide dogs and other dogs from a different project that we're doing that's relating to the gene genetics of separation anxiety. And if I had more t time, I could possibly talk about that one as well. Um, but um, so we have a lot of Labradors because Labrador is one of our target breeds for that study. And so what we just did was to compare the um, genotyping array data for these elite retrieving dogs with the uh, everyday Labradors from all other places that we could find. We also had some high resolution data for these dogs. Um, we have whole genome sequencing. So rather than just reading 170,000 markers, the canine genome, as some of you, if you were listening yesterday, may have learned, has 2.5 billion DNA letters in it. And so with the arrays, we're looking at um, 170,000, or actually now it's 230,000 markers, which is a very small proportion of the total. But with these dogs with the whole genome sequencing, if we want to, we can look at every single letter in their genome. So that's important, and that helps us to figure out what might be going on. That's Ben. He's an Australian Labrador. Australian elite retrieving Labrador. So there are some that are still the Australian lines. So uh, let me explain this plot. So in genomics, we often do things that help us to ascertain if we're dealing with a homogeneous population. What this, what the way we do that is we look at the different markers and we assess those different markers for different dogs and we kind of combine, to, we, we plot near one another the dogs that, whose markers are kind of similar to one another and further apart are those that are more different from one another. And you can do this in many different direct dimensions, but I'm just plotting here the first two dimensions because that's sufficient to um, show the differences that we're dealing with here. And so what you can see is that rather than looking like a ball, which would be ideal, um, we have here something that looks more like a three-leaf clover where... Um, we can easily see the, by, the, by the individuals that are near one another, we can tell which population they belong to. And so, for example, um, up here, all of these dogs in this area here are guide dogs or um, service dogs. So they're a little bit different than most of the dogs. Here we have um, the English type Labradors that form the majority of the samples that we've collected. Here we have some dogs that have been admixed in some way with American um, type bloodlines and over here are the more American type dogs. So you can see that it stratifies them out quite easily. And if we look at the elite retrieving family, what we can see is that they are clustered very uh, much in this direction over here. So if you read about, here's Snow here. And if you read about Snow, Snow has a, this is from the Breeders website. Snow has a high work ethic loves training, great memory, loves the water, will hunt all day and is sociable. 
and then Missy is one of the others over here, I can't remember which one now, but Missy has extremely high drive, no quit, athletic, outstanding work ethic. Missy keeps everyone on their toes. And so actually if you go to trial and you see these, because we hang around with each other after the trial, well, oftentimes these are in remote properties so most people stay nearby. Sometimes we're camping or staying in a local pub. Um, you'll see these dogs get out of the car and they're like, woo, <laughs> they're, they're, they're quite active. They're very, very different than your average sort of Labrador. So um, I collected a number of dogs from the National and State Retrieving Trials and also from the kennels that produced those and compared those dogs with the others. Now, just as if you saw the first part of my uh, talk, you would have seen that I used two different approaches to look at the problem there. Um, and in that case, we used a top-down approach where we went from just we're interested in the phenotypes of the other traits of the animals. And uh, then we had a bottom-up approach where we looked at the genetic differences between the animals. So for this study, we're using that kind of bottom-up approach where we're interested in just looking at the genomic differences. But within that bottom-up approach, there are also two different things we can do because we have this admix population that gives us another special tool that we might not have had available to us otherwise. Because if we know the pedigrees of these animals, we can tell precisely how much USA blood they have in them. So we can, tell, we can, we can know whether to expect that the USA-derived allele is, um, should be homozygous or heterozygous in those dogs. So for example, if you have a dog that's only ever had a USA father and an Australian mother and those behave differently, we would expect that the USA allele will only be there as a heterozygous one, which means that the animal has two different ones and never as a homozygous one. If we have an animal that's a back-crossed animal to the US lines, then that could have two copies of the US allele. So there are two different questions we can ask. Um, the first one is, it, it, it relates to the hypothesis of the fact that just being from the USA, um, that gives you some advantage in retrieving trial. Because most of us realise that the USA-derived Labradors have a different phenotype than the English-style Labradors. And most of you that live in America would have recognised that yourselves. So more often you see the, US, uh, the English type in the show ring. They tend to be heavier and lower and bigger. Um, and so with this admixture map mapping, we use the pedigree with the hypothesis that it's just the USA physicality, if you like, that affords the skill benefit in this retrieving trial situation. So here we have the judge, we have the handler at the, at the firing point and uh, the dog is ready, he's got no lead on. The person is getting ready to shoot and now the judge over here has just signalled the person to launch the bird at which point this guy will fire and then when the bird lands this dog will be sent to capture it had not capture it because it's already dead, but to pick it up and bring it back. So we knew the pedigrees of these dogs. Um, we wanted to identify these particular variants that were enriched in dogs with the USA type that had the correct um, combination of alleles given their pedigree. Um, and typically using, because we're actually using that um, spread of the data that we saw on the chart, we expect our probability values to be stronger in this type of analysis than we might see otherwise. And so from this preliminary analysis, uh, admixture analysis, we identified a region on chromosome 20 and most of the genes in this region related to body fat. So um, strangely, the haplotype that was present in um, the elite retrieving dogs for this um, area of the genome was the same one that we see in the boxer and in the whippet. So that gives you an idea of it being um, that kind of body type, more like a boxer or a whippet than like your flabrador. That said, um, I don't want you to leap to conclusions and think that maybe these dogs are crossbred. I mean, it's possible they are, but it's way more likely that this haplotype was already in the Labrador breed, but just at a very low frequency and that those dogs had been selected against for showing. 
Um, so I'm sure that, you know, occasionally these might come out. But um, in any case, this does not say that these dogs are crossbred by any means. It just it's a characteristic of all dog breeds that they share a lot of their DNA with each other because they all came from wolves way back when. And um, so I don't want you to take away that these dogs are crossbred, not purebred in any way. Not that it would matter if they were, I mean, in my mind, although they are registered with the kennel organisation, so they probably don't want to think that they might be crossbred. Okay, so another signal that we found, so this is a very strong probability here, uh, very, 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 very significant. Um, and then we had another signal on a different chromosome and in this area of the genome we found in using the same sort of um, method that we use for the Kelpies where we used the mouse uh, resource to tell us what the genes do in that area, we found a gene that was associated with hyperactivity in mice. So this probably has something to do with energy level in those dogs. So these were the two very strongest signals in those data. Another thing we can do is to um, be a little bit more stringent about the dogs that we're looking at. And so this is a different, to test a different hypothesis, which is now if we have dogs that are already of this USA type, so not the Flabradors anymore, we're not using them, we'll just cut our analysis down and just use the dogs that are clustering with the USA with these dogs so that they're similar across their entire genome. Can we then identify something about these national and state trial champion retrievers that's different than um, the traits of the, the other dogs of USA type that we have in our analysis? That includes my dog Theo, who was born in the USA but doesn't retrieve. Um, so this cut down co cohort includes only 25 USA dogs, so it's kind of a bit underpowered at the moment. Um, but as I said, this is uh, research that's ongoing, so we're not published this yet. Um, so when we do this, um, it's a similar kind of story in a way to the Kelpie story because we found a locus that was associated with mechanosensitivity, which is another thing related to that nociception idea of um, with sensitivity being touched. And so... I'll, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what these dogs need to do that might impact this. So first of all, um, in the Australian conditions, oftentimes in a retrieving trial, the judges will place the, the, the item of game to be retrieved behind a barrier, and that barrier might be brambles, for example. So there might be a great big pile of brambles in front of the dog that it has to run through to pick up that bird and then come back. And actually the judge that was in the previous uh, photo who was signalling, there's a funny story because um, that judge, I was, I was help, I was stewarding for him one day and um, we were chatting while he, was, while he was judging and one of these elite dogs ran out and there was, he'd put the brambles in the way of the bird but his intention was that the dog should run around the brambles and get the bird and then run back again and, and um, so this dog ran directly, it burrowed through the brambles to, to get the bird and then started to come back and he goes, and, and it came back the same way and he goes, gee, he goes, oh, I gave that dog an extra point because he went through the brambles on the way out and that showed he was really brave but then I took the point off on the way back because he was stupid enough to come back the same way. <laughs> So, um, so we found this variant here. We actually found a, um, a, a coding variant in this gene that relates to mechanosensitivity. So this is important. Another thing though, that, that's a, and that's a very good p-value given the small number of samples that we have. Another um, thing that might play into this is that while it's illegal to trial with or use electronic collars in Australia, it is actually... Um, allowable to use them in America. And so the USA dogs that have been imported have probably been selected to be less um, bothered by the use of an electronic collar in training than, um, than the other dogs. So it could be that as well. But this being able to run through a bunch of prickles is definitely an advantage as well. Another um, gene that came up was one that related to stress response. 
And, and you can see that there's a bit of a theme developing here with these working dogs if you looked at the last um, talk because it's the same kind of um, genes that are impacting their working success. And at the end of the day, if you can't get out there and do the job that you're required to do without having being distracted by things, small things, well, sometimes not small things, but, but if you can't get out there and do the job that you're required to do, then you can't you will never be good at it and you'll never be selected as an elite dog in that field. So you'll never be probably as prevalent in a breeding program as a dog that is able to do all these things. And so, um, but the interesting thing about this stress response gene was that it was in, it was a different gene, but in exactly the same pathway as the one that was identified in the admixture analysis. So that's kind of interesting too. And the really interesting thing about that gene is that in mice, it's associated with um, uh, noise, uh, uh, reactivity to noise. And if you think about a retrieving dog, they have a gun fired over their head. So I challenge any of you that has a border collie to go out and have a dog sit by you while you fire a gun over its head. I mean, this is a, this is a no, like, a, this is a stop or go requirement of being a retrieving dog is that you need to be steady to what's called steady to shot, which means that you can handle big bangs happening around you and not be bothered by them. So um, in summary, uh, with this study, the variants that we found depended on the hypothesis that we used to find them. So with our admixture analysis, um, which the hypothesis is that you just need to come from the USA and you'll be better, which might you know, please the people sitting here. Um, it just says that we're just looking for dogs that are of American type. Being of American type alone is enough to make you better at this job, which um, I'm not sure I buy because of my dog Theo, but hey, that's a, that's a hypothesis and hypothesis. Another one, um, but we have more power for this one, so that's why it's worth pursuing in this context. Another hypothesis is that we can look for elite uh, retrieving dog differences when compared with other Labradors of the same type. And when we do that, uh, we found some really interesting things related, relating to their ability to be steady to shot and their ability to deal with um, uh, pressures that might be put on them by the environment when they're working in the field. And I just wanted to stress that this work is currently uh, ongoing and preliminary. So that's the end of the retrieving part. In the next part, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I wasn't quite finished. Um, and the admixture mapping revealed so, uh, regions associated with uh, adiposity, which is how fat you are. I could use a bit of that, less of that now. Um, stress response and olfactory axon guidance. And then the association analysis revealed associations with regions um, relating to mechanosensitivity and stress sensitivity and in particular acoustic startle. So um, the next uh, thing that I want to talk to you about, which I think is really exciting, is um, the evolution of reproductive behaviour in the dog. And uh, I don't know how many of you are aware that uh, in wild canids, they only ever have one breeding season in a year. Whereas most domestic dogs have two breeding seasons in a year. And this relates a lot to um, propensity for dog. There's There are many consequences of this, very many important consequences of this. One is that the rate of generational turnover is potentially doubled. And this means that for any selection program in a dog that has two breeding seasons a year can potentially make twice as much progress. Um, and also there's twice as many opportunities for evolution to do its work in relation to natural variation that arises in those animals and to diverge those populations from one another. And so I was, I was really interested in this idea of whether we could get at the understanding of what generates these two, uh, the genes that underlie these two uh, breeding seasons in the domestic dog versus one in our wolves and coyotes and dingoes only have one reproductive season. And so um, I decided to try and have a look at this problem. So um, there was a study that was done in the dingo that showed that um, if they were studying dogs around Aboriginal settlements 
in Australia and they found that where the dingoes had hybridised with the domestic dogs, they actually did through biopsy uh, of uh, spayed dogs, they noted that the hybrids between the dingoes and the domestic dogs typically had only one reproductive season per year. So that means that it's kind of a dominant sort of effect that you see it in the animals that only have one copy of the gene. But most, not all, and even within a breed, not all, um, most domestic dogs breeds have two seasons per year. So I decided to go to the source of best information, which is the breeders, and ask them, did they know of any domestic breeds that only ever had one breeding season per year? And the breeders um, went off on several tangents, but came back and told me that actually there were two breeds that they knew of. In fact, there was another one identified, but I didn't have any data for it, that have only one breeding season per year. And actually one of those I kind of already knew about because I'd read about it in Scott and Fuller that the Bazenji only had one breeding season in the year. But um, they identified another breed, which was the Tibetan, Tibetan Mastiff, which also has only one breeding season in the year. But what surprised me, were, well, I thought, well, I'll try and quantify this. So what I did was I wrote to the Australian National Kennel Council and I asked them, could I purchase pedigree records for those breeds? And what amazed me when I, um, when I downloaded them, I just, the only part that I used was the birthday of the dog. And so what I did is I just did a histogram of the birthdays of the dogs according to the month of the year. And I expected, I didn't really know what I expected to see, but it certainly wasn't that I expected to see what I actually saw, which was that in those dogs that have only one breeding season per year, 90% of the dogs are born within a four month period. And the dogs that are off target here, uh, the breeders identified as having been recently imported or the progeny of recently imported dogs. <coughs> but other breeds that we had, um, we did a, a study on pedigree dogs some time ago now and we had a lot of data from those. And from those, I was able to identify a group of uh, breeds that actually, it didn't matter what month you're in, and these are thousands, all of these are thousands of records. No, these are not a few dogs, these are a lot of dogs. These, some of these are 80,000 records of these dogs. And these dogs really don't care what, what month of the year they breed in. They'll just breed any old time. And these are typically the dogs that have two seasons per year. And these are typically the dogs that have one season per year. And then there's a bunch of breeds that are kind of in betweenies as well. But I want to focus on the, the two um, breeds that are very diverged here. And so I was able to obtain some public data that, um, that contained information for these breeds and was able to um, <coughs> analyse that to see if I could identify the source of the difference of these breeds, of these two um, patterns of reproduction that these breeds showed. And um, there was a paper published last year that actually included data for the breeds that I'm interested in. And the wolves are, are so what this shows is a, a sort of a genomic similarity between different dog breeds. And the longer the, the, longer the lines in between them, um, from the base here, the more different they are. And the black here is the wolf, so it starts down at the centre here. And then the further away you get from the wolf, the more diverged they are from the wolf. And if we look at um, our breeds that have only one season per year, you can see that they're clustered down here, right here with the wolf, just in this section here. So they're the most similar breeds to the wolf. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense, right? Because if you only have one, if you only have half the generations to be different from the wolf, of course you're going to be more like the wolf. If you've got twice as many generations to be different from the wolf, of course you're going to be more different from the wolf. So these animals have had less time evolutionarily to, to diverge from the wolf than the other breeds have. Whereas if we look at our breeds that don't care, we find them over here in the areas that are furthest away from the wolf. So um, when we think about how different dog breeds are, you know, everybody says how, how dog breeds are like the most diverged species phenotypically on Earth. Here we have a perfect reason why 
sometime early in their evolutionary history, they had this genetic change that enabled them to breed quite twice as quickly and with litters to make twice as much genetic progress as you might do with a wolf. So of course, as soon as we start selecting them, we can make amazing changes in these animals. And that's how we end up with all the different morphologies that we see today. This one change, this one change, means that the breeding rate is restricted only by their gestational, gestation length and lactational anestrus. And they, so they have, <clears throat> in a dog, you typically have two weeks of estrus period, two to three weeks, nine weeks of gestation, and then four to eight weeks of lactation, depending on the mother, how, how much she likes feeding the pups once they've got teeth. And then, um, but so it's unlikely that we'll ever get it to be more than two times a year using this particular physiology. So while this started out as being like a behaviour question, a reproductive behaviour question, it's kind of ended up as a physiological difference that's um, between these two groups. <coughs> so um, we have mapped the differences between these breeds. We have identified um, the changes that are there. Um, the most interesting, the strongest difference. There, so given that there was a seasonal variation that immediately brought to my mind that likely there was a circadian involvement. So was it Chris's talk that showed the animals that changed their pelage in the winter? Um, so <clears throat> in some animals, this seasonal difference makes the animals change their pelage in their pelage or coat in the winter. So they might go from a brown coat to a white coat. And um, these animals always have their pups in the winter. So even if you change, if you bring those pups, because that was Australia. So in Australia, winter is now, you know, we're coming into winter. So all the puppies are being born now in, in these breeds in Australia. And apparently it's not just the girls that have their season then. Apparently the boys are not interested in breeding at other times of the year either. So there's a very distinct behavioural difference between these single season a year breeds and the other breeds. And, and the in-betweenies are different too. Uh, they, they require more exploration as well. So the obvious place to look was um, at the circadian rhythm genes. And so I've done a lot of uh, learning about how circadian clocks work. And um, <clears throat> clearly there is a circadian difference between these dogs. Um, but we also have a novel gene that we found. And I'd never heard of this gene before. I'm not going to say what it is now. I've got a paper that's about to be in review. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about the gene that we found is that it identifies <clears throat> a brand new method of environmental sensing with respect to reproduction that is independent of the melatonin system. So um, it's a gene that actually <clears throat> the exposure to UV light and temperature physically changes the behaviour of the gene and it um, changes the pathway of the products <coughs> of that gene from a pathway where those products are dissipated through the urine to one where those products go on to become reproductive hormones. So it's a wonderful, wonderful and very interesting story. And actually we're really, this is really interesting for us Right now we're in um, talks with the Meat and Livestock Australia because seasonal breeding in other species is also very important from a production and feeding the world viewpoint. And so um, we're anxious to see if our discovery is valid in species besides canines. One reason we think we might be on the right kind of path with this um, study is that um, in, there's a, a wonderful researcher, Cheryl Asser, from the uh, St. Louis Zoo, who's been very interested in canine uh, reproduction for some time. And they did an experiment when, where they uh, removed the pineal gland from wolves and found that their reproductive behaviour was unchanged. And that might mean nothing to most of you, but for those who understand circadian biology, the pineal gland is believed to be the seat of the, pine, of the um, circadian uh, hormone melatonin. And so that's meant to be the driver of most of these physiological differences in these animals. Um, also, um, the hormones that are changed as a result of this, not just reproductive hormones, but they might impact other aspects of behaviour as well.
So it's a really, 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 really interesting finding. It's really early days. It's quite new, quite a new discovery, but we're really excited to see to see where that can go. Um, the interesting thing for me is when I look at the regions that were associated in this analysis, the extremely strong p-values. I mean, the, the divergence between the two groups of dogs was absolute. Like, there's absolutely no... There, I think there was one dog that had a heterozygous allele for the selected gene and the rest were completely homozygous, the opposite directions. Um, but um, where was I going with this? So... Um, but the interesting thing is when you look at these regions, and this harks back to what we were talking about in the discussion yesterday, when you look at the regions that show up in this analysis, it's like, these are like old friends, these regions. We get the Kelpie region, we get the regions associated with the floppy ears, with the white markings, we get the whole, the whole array of things. Like there are these, uh, the genes that are implicated here are those genes that are the domestication genes. And I think that it all harks back to this, both the melatonin-based syndrome, uh, sorry, the melatonin system, plus this new system that we've identified that really needs a lot more work to be explained in any meaningful way at this point. So um, that's about where we're up to with our work. Um, this is my girl Trouble. She was also the one in the reproduction shot. We've got some beautiful little puppies at home right now uh, that I'm missing very much. And um, I, these are the uh, competitors from the National Retrieving Trial down here that was sponsored by a Royal Cannon. Um, I really want to thank um, particularly Paul McGreevy, Liz Arnott and Jonathan Early and Liz, uh, Lisa Mascord for the Farm Dog Project, which has been going on for a few years now. Um, and particularly from my lab, all of my lab, but in particular, I want to thank um, Dr. Callie Willett and um, Diane Van Roy, who some of you in the behaviour world might have heard of. So Diane has been working with me. Um, I've got a bit of time, so I'll just say Diane's been working with me for some years now. Um, we've, been <clears throat> we've been collecting behavioural survey data um, connected with DNA data for Labradors and Golden Retrievers that suffer from separation anxiety and also those that don't. Um, and we've been trying to map uh, genes that underlie separation anxiety in the dog. And so we actually do have, she's produced a, um, an association, which is kind of relevant to this story in a way, because one of the major signals of association that she has in the Labrador actually sits right near one of my circadian biology regions. So um, all, it's all connected, all is one, I think. Um, and so my sense is that when we're, when we're, I wonder sometimes when we're mapping things, if we're actually just identifying the ancestral wolf version that we've selected away from becomes the, the one that gives us our strong signals when we look at, at different aspects of our um, behaviour and physiology that we're interested in in the domestic dogs. So thank you all for listening um, during my presentation. I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's a new thing for me to be doing a webinar. I haven't done one before. Thank goodness there's an audience here too. It would be much harder. And, uh, and I'd, I'd love to hear you talk to us some more about some questions that you have about my work or to text uh, to, to, sh to show us your animals watching, watching our webinar. Um, it's been wonderful having you along. So thank you very, 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 very much for, for having me in your living room this morning.